Okay, we're on to our next session here. Um, we're going to discuss the evolution of OT systems management with Rick Kahn, the Vice President of Solutions for Verve Industrial Protection. And uh, Rick's going to talk us a little bit more through why organizations should embrace the concept of OT systems management, paralleling ITSM practices. And uh, we have 35 minutes plus some time for questions. So Rick, without further ado, over to you, sir. Thank you, James, appreciate it. Uh, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, as James had talked about, I wanna talk a little bit about systems management and the parallel to ITSM or IT systems management. A um, uh, Couple of case studies here from things we've seen in other industries. Um, when I walk through a little bit of introduction to who I am, I've got a couple of case studies in here. Uh, and really what I wanna do is stretch the imagination today. Um, there's a lot of things that we get told we can't do in OT. Um, and we of course have to be careful, but I think we need to be a little more creative. And so hopefully some of the things that we share today and, and that are, are derived from actual end users in the field will, will resonate and, and maybe we can have a good dialogue about this. So uh, who are we? Verve Industrial Protection is actually a systems integrator first and an OT security provider second. So we were founded over 25 years ago by an electrical engineer doing DCS upgrades, PLC programming, et cetera. And over hey, time, Bill, sorry, sorry, sorry to inter sorry to interrupt you. I'm just I'm going to hold off for another one and a half minutes because I don't think participants have been allowed in yet. Uh, I apologize. It. That's my start. Yeah. That's my fault. They're just coming in now. No worries. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Our next session is with Rick Kahn, Verve Industrial Protection Vice President of Solutions the evolution of OT systems management. I started this one a little bit early. So when you watch the recording of this, you're gonna hear an introduction twice. I apologize. Rick has 20 plus years in designing and implementing OT security programs, tailoring projects to clients and industries, including oil and gas, refining, mining, power and manufacturing. Rick always approaches engagements with an eye towards building a scalable, cost-effective and manageable solution. So this is Rick Kahn with Verve industrial protection on the evolution of OT systems management. Over to you, Rick, thank you very much. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, so today we wanna to talk a little bit about some of the lessons we've seen in those 20 years that James mentioned I've, I've been around for. I've, I've seen, I've been around long enough to see, you know, multiple comings of the silver bullet in terms of, uh, you know, originally whitelisting and, and now today uh, people's uh, being enamored with, uh, you know, easy solutions. There's no easy button in OT. Um, but we shouldn't take no for an answer. Too many times we're told what we can't do. Um, and so what I hope today to do today is to stretch your imagination a little bit into what we should be doing or could be doing, uh, but also to bring you some case studies of actual end users that are currently uh, deploying some of these concepts and what the significant change, a step change in, in results uh, and the benefits that they get from it. So it's, it's kind of taking what we're doing now, um, reinventing it and, and adding some, some IT um, principles with, with very much an OT safety perspective. So um, start with some introductions and then set the stage a bit this is the way we see it as to why we think there needs to be a change and what the benefits might be. Walk you through what we think the core components are and then again share some some real life experiences from some of our own um, uh, clients and, and some that range in size from smaller mom and pop manufacturing to large global organizations. Uh, the same principles uh, are, are leverageable across all those scenarios. So who is Verve? Verve is uh, actually first and foremost an OT systems integrator. So uh, our founder is a electrical engineer, uh, started his own consulting company 25, almost 26 years ago. Um, and so we have tons of experience doing DCS upgrades, PLC programming, you name it. And everything I'm about to show you today then is built by that same OT perspective uh, and has many, many years uh, in that OT space. I know some of you have heard of us and more of you are hearing us for the first time <clears throat> or only recently. We actually, what I'm showing you today um, has been in deployed, uh, safely deployed and, and in operation and operational environments for over 13 years. Um, so we're not late to the game. We're not uh, you know, trying to grab a, a, a new market share. We actually have something that's pretty well proven and, and developed in this space. I myself have been all around the world in various sizes and shapes of organizations um, and, and industries as James already indicated, but we're not here to hear about me. We're here to hear about the topic. So um, 
getting started. So setting the stage, uh, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with the children's book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. Uh, but the basic premise is you give a mouse a cookie and then he's going to want a glass of milk. And then he's going to ask for a mirror because he's afraid that maybe there's some crumbs on his face. And then he's going to notice his hair is out of pace, uh, place. So he's going to want to borrow a, a comb, et cetera, et cetera. And so the cycle starts uh, for many organizations with wanting to grab at what is considered low hanging fruit or a first step. Um, and so, you know, many people have done that and, and, and managed to build a security program through what we call a punch list. So if you look at the 10 or 15 things you think you need, you need an architecture, you need some sort of backup solution, you need some sort of protection in the form of antivirus or what have you, and you need the patch. Those are great individual pieces. And as you start in your program with an inventory, you're then going to want to go back and revisit to understand risk and et cetera, et cetera. And so <clears throat> the development of a security program is much like the, the, the fable or the Torah story of uh, giving a mouse a cookie. The challenge is um, that we end up with a patchwork of tools and approaches. Um, and, and this is no more obvious than what we've seen uh, in, in the emergence of a regulated industry. Uh, of course, in North America, <clears throat> NERC SIP was a big deal. Now there's an argument that um, security is not compliance, but we can still extract some lessons learned from that, uh, from that environment. And what we've seen that environment evolve into is what we call first generation security program. Um, and a first generation security program is that disparate collection of individual tool sets that help to hopefully build the big picture. But they weren't necessarily built with the big picture in mind. They were built by putting out this fire and then this fire. And unfortunately, there's some, some drawbacks to that. So for example, um, the challenge in maintaining that type of program is significant. Um, tasks such as patch review, configuration management, logging, et cetera. Um, we started with them as we get further down the path. And I know that many uh, European and Middle Eastern countries are now rolling up their own um, roadmap for regulation and best practice. And they all start with some sort of inventory, which is great. Um, but if we just look at inventory as the only issue, we won't necessarily look at where we're going. Um, and so we need to have a different perspective on making decisions today that will continue to return value in multiple phases because it's going to get more complex. Um, the number of IP enabled assets that we have to worry about continue to grow. Uh, regulatory and reporting standards continue to evolve. Um, and, and, and again, many organizations already have some investments in disparate solutions in many of these areas. Um, we also have a challenge for many OEM type uh, organizations that each OEM sort of has their own solution. And so if you have multiple vendors, you probably have a need for multiple uh, platforms. Um, segmentation may not be consistent. Our best uh, laid plans and intentions may not exist. Um, and vulnerability scans, which is what many organizations have traditionally done for vulnerability management or vulnerability analysis anyway, um, scan-based is very concerning in OT. You can't scan everything, you can't scan it all the time, and so you usually get a subset of data that ages over time. Um, security we often see is best effort or manual, so very tedious. Um, an organizational view, um, we often see very different reporting and management capabilities either within an organization, i.e. there's a compliance and reporting person, and then there's a technical person that actually does the work, and the two interact, but they don't necessarily collaborate. So the results then, as I mentioned, when you have this sort of view, <clears throat> individual silos of information or, or responsibilities sort of popping up to handle different components, what happens is you get a what we call the first generation approach, which is a complex set of tools. In fact, we, see, we saw one client that has 55 different security tools, seven of which are patching. I, I'm not sure I can name seven individual patching solutions. Um, there's no real centralized visibility. So even though we have pockets of information and we're challenged when we actually have to pull something together, um, there's a lot of insecurity, there's an added cost and effort uh, because of the manual effort, the duplication of effort, um, maybe starting at the top of an IP address list as opposed to starting with critical risk. Um, and this often leads to mistakes. Um, one example you can Google if you'd like is a company called Duke in, uh, in North America. Um, they were supposed to be doing regulatory um, program and they had a whole bunch of tools that they invested lots of money in. Um, the challenge was that when they were actually deeply audited, they uncovered systemic um, failure to adhere to what they built. The tools weren't being used, uh, the data wasn't being communicated, uh, the procedures weren't being followed, um, and they negotiated a $10 million settlement. So in other words, that was the slap on the wrist rather than going line by line. I'm not trying to scare people with FUD and uncertainty in dollars. I'm just trying to point out that if we don't have a sustainable, manageable program, 
we're probably going to um, not get the benefit out of our of our tool sets. And when the time comes, whether it's regulatory or actually incident based, um, we might have significant challenges in, in being able to actually execute. So how do you start then? I don't want to throw things out, uh, but I think one of the things that one of our clients has learned, and we actually had a client who had exactly that sort of first generation um, look and feel. They had some backup solutions and some antivirus. They'd been doing manual lockdowns for inventory. But then the organization came back from a high level and said, let's do something a little more realistic. And what I'm showing you here is sort of a way to stretch the imagination and look at um, what an overall program is. And that's why we talk about starting with the end in mind. Uh, we want to make sure that um, we know what it is we're trying to build. And so, for example, with respect to inventory, um, <clears throat> if I were to just look for a cursory inventory to at least understand how big my issue is or how many I have, I might select something uh, uh, like a collection of existing tool sets pulled from this database or that maintenance, whatever, and stitch them together. I may want to look at a passive anomaly detection uh, uh, tool, which uh, promises to at least give you um, uh, your base understanding of inventory. Um, but you may want, if you were to look rather at this whole program and realize that after you do inventory, you're then going to need to map vulnerabilities to it, configuration and system configuration, et cetera. And you might make a different decision about what is an inventory. An inventory, when you get to backups and, and system hardening and least privilege and, and incident response, is going to require other data around those assets uh, that, a, that a, a, just an IP list won't gather. So maybe you'll make different decisions when you're looking at the whole program. So if we start with the end in mind, um, and, and we typically build, build this based on a combination of regulatory needs and, and, and best practices or lessons learned, what would, your, what would be on your wish list if you got a do-over? We have lots and lots of clients, potential clients coming to us today and literally sending us a spreadsheet with the word wish list in it. Um, and it ranges everything from inventory to vulnerability to, to management. Um, would you want to aggregate your data from different sources so you could look at one console and understand your, your true system? Um, would you want a single pane of glass across multiple sites so that you could share expertise and insight and, and do research once and share it multiple times? Um, and what about the component of management? Uh, again, not to pick on any one particular tool set, but I'm picking more on the, on the industry trend to jump on, on passive anomaly detection as a, as a silver bullet to give me um, uh, visibility and insight. And they are absolutely fundamentally uh, amazing technology and engineered very well for anomaly detection. Um, and when they go off, that means you have something that's wrong. But if you haven't architected how you're going to fix things, your response, your recover, uh, your return to normal, uh, or even the tools to reduce the risk in the first place, that's a great add-on, but it really is a fire alarm. You still need the fire system, the fire safety program, the fire extinguishers, et cetera. So again, you know, look at your, the management portion of your assets, not just the insight or the visibility. Um, and the final uh, you know, scope is there needs to be a bigger discussion around you know, what does done look like? I mean, if we, if we look at CSC 20, for example, they actually have maturity levels for different expectations. And so it's not ambiguous. It's not thou shalt have an inventory and thou shalt patch. There's much more granularity as to the speed, the timing, the automation, uh, the interval between actions, et cetera. So taking um, uh, the view of approaching security as an entire program with individual functions that have um, uh, quantitative um, expectations of achievement or maturity goes a long, long way to helping you make uh, more informed decisions. And you'll see what this looks like in a minute. So we had, a, uh, I promised a couple of case studies. The company I told you about that had the patchwork but wanted to work together, their uh, transmission and distribution plus generation and renewables, so a multi-discipline um, power company. Um, they had six different DCS vendors in their various major DCS. They actually had that close to 50 if you included all the supporting little relays and PLCs and, and supporting equipment. Um, they had multiple segmentation in each facility. They had multiple backup and antivirus platforms because of uh, their need uh, to support and appease multiple different vendors. Um, they were using a scan-based vulnerability assessment tool, which was done annually during a turnaround or outage. Um, and so there were 12 months between cycles of that information, that data. Um, and the inventory was built at the beginning of the project. They weren't doing so great at updating their, their inventory. In fact, one of the six sites when we walked it down um, was wrong. The inventory sheet was wrong by 500%. So what they did though, was they reset their approach. They built a multidiscipline roadmap. <clears throat> 
Uh, and they first, uh, as I mentioned, they used the CSC 20. And the first thing they did was they examined the objective and determined the tool set viability. And this meant some of the existing tools were reused or expanded and others were potentially uh, uh, upgraded or replaced. Um, but what they did was they took the piecemeal approach and they applied it. Uh, they first looked at their overall approach and then saw what they had for pieces to maybe potentially reuse. Um, the objective was to get to automated maturity. Uh, and as I mentioned, the CSC 20 has an interesting set of maturity levels, um, but it's very, very prescriptive. A lot of the industry standards say you should and you shall, and it's best to do this. But the CSC says, if you want an, auto, uh, an inventory maturity level of one, then you have a you know, robust inventory. If you want a maturity level of two, then you have an inventory and it gets updated at whatever frequency. And if you want a maturity level of three, your inventory is automated at a regular interval and verified. And so you can easily see how you could start without trying to boil the ocean uh, and build your objectives. And then you come back and layer the technology and the tools over top. They then plan to roll out on overall scope uh, for sites, assets during outages, et cetera. Uh, and they effectively moved from reactive to being proactive. So they went from that one inventory being wrong by 500% to now having at their fingertips the ability to see any one of their assets and its current status, and it was never more than 15 minutes old, automatically updated. So what were the key components? Uh, as I mentioned, inventory is key, and that's kind of why I picked on a little bit earlier to make sure we all understand that inventory is a key component, but it keeps giving back, just like the mouse and the cookie, right? If you look at the cycle on, this, on the right over here, you start with an inventory, you then make sure you pull in your vulnerabilities, what patches are applied to those are applicable. Um, and then let's start to look at least privilege and insecure configurations. What about the users and dormant accounts? We had a, an oil sands client the other day discover 47 administrative accounts on critical systems. Those 47 belonged to people who no longer worked for the organization. Um, Anti-malware, antivirus, whitelisting, network protections, et cetera, back into OT context. Once I get a risk, do I treat all assets equally or do I prioritize those that are high impact to my operations? And so you're always coming back and wanting to update because a lot of these things change. So inventory with context, the ability to take actions, we need to be able to manage and reduce risk. We need to be able to alert when things happen and we need to be able to report and track live as we're making progress. All of these need to be automatically updated for you to have a fighting chance because to manually maintain all of these um, is a fool's errand. Now, we advocate a single platform because it can be done and we're proving that it is. Um, you can bring in your inventory from all your different asset uh, characteristics, uh, OS-based networking and your truly embedded stuff. Once you have that inventory and add context to it, you then with a single interface can look at your data from any single uh, perspective. And this is kind of um, what we see as the holy grail or the future of OT management because this gives you unparalleled visibility, either from an overall view, red, yellow, green for the CISO of doing well, doing poorly, uh, one step down into a more detailed view. I just wanna look at vulnerability versus configuration or patch or users or what have you. Or you can drill right into uh, what our risk looks like and what our risk profile is and how we're increasing or decreasing that profile. And I'll talk a little bit more about this infrastructure and how it plays into our case studies in a moment. Um, and so then what I'm advocating is if we, depart from the single individual silo tool and actually look at more of a program where we automate and aggregate data and content. We then are now approaching uh, security as a multi-dimensional, multi-discipline program. Um, it allows us to work proactively with our vendors and with other departments within our organization to say, look, this is our corporate standard. We all need to row the boat in the same direction. Um, and many OEMs are starting to loosen restrictions. We continue to talk to more and more OEMs where we are jointly going in with the OEM to uh, build a robust program for our client as opposed to um, vendor specific on a subset of assets. Uh, and so more and more OEMs are starting to see that the future uh, needs to be a little more adaptable to be able to support um, the install base. Um, aggregating data sources to better focus on risk and compensating controls. And I'll talk through that a little bit. Like I mentioned, it's one thing to have an inventory. It's another to have an alert relative to that asset but what is that asset in my organization? Is it a critical asset to my safe operations or is it a redundant or supporting asset? Does it have other compensating controls like the presence of a, a recent a good backup and is whitelisting and lockdown? Um, all these sorts of things, these data sources allow you to make informed decisions and actually pivot into 
the next phase, which is risk reduction or management. And that's why I sort of highlighted here, many, many organizations are striving for visibility and management and fixing and correction and endpoint touching uh, is, is a future consideration. Um, and I'm advocating the exact opposite. You want to discover these things because you need to know how bad and how much work they need. And so if you don't have an eye towards managing them once you discover it, um, you'll be going back to the drawing board for an, an extra set of tools. Um, and that's why I point out that vulnerability management is management, not just assessment. Um, anybody can give you a big red dashboard of a bunch of problems. I once had a plant manager say to me, you're gonna come do an assessment and you're gonna tell me that I don't patch and I don't change passwords. I already know that, and how does it help me? Um, and so helping to have ways to manage and reduce risk is where we need to evolve to next. Um, and, and just to sort of hammer it home, the Spanish Armada learned this the hard way. I don't know how many history buffs are on the, on the call. I'm, I'm certainly not one. I, I managed to watch a cool uh, Discovery Channel uh, show and now I suddenly think I'm an expert. <laughs> but uh, what struck me about the Spanish Armada was that when they built their Armada, they actually built a standard sized uh, cannon uh, and standard sized um, ammunition. Whereas the, 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 their, their um, opponents, their foes at the time, uh, had various different shipbuilding yards and they all built their own standards and their own capabilities so that when you had the Spanish Armada, any single piece of ammunition could be thrown in any single cannon and they were able to outgun uh, their opponents significantly despite them being outnumbered and outmanned. And in fact, they, they extra extracted a very, very huge toll um, on the opposition because they had uniformity, because they had the visibility, because they had the foresight to be able to have interchangeable parts that were all driving towards the end goal. Um, so what are some of the organizational principles? Uh, that alignment at the top, um, we, the, the case study I showed you a moment ago, um, the CISO standardized the CSC20, and then the CISO was made available to every single business unit to interpret how those standards and, and challenges for um, establishing and managing security were to be maintained. Um, they built an overall portfolio of initiatives that, that again, leveraged multiple business units and perspectives. So there was a multidiscipline approach it wasn't a siloed, this isn't my concern, this is your concern, this is someone else's, or what have you. Um, following the money, this is very, very hard in OT. We always try to show people that you can improve your security management uh, cost, but the reality is that a lot of it's not being done to begin with. So <laughs> improving on a task that isn't normally done is, is hard to measure ROI, but you still can track different initiatives, reporting, uh, as you see there, analyze total spend, determine budget commitment, et cetera. Thinking global and act local, um, this is a nod towards uh, this, the dwindling or, or scarcity of, of OT security staff. Uh, and I've got a couple slides on that in a minute, including a case study about it, so I'm going to pause on that one. Uh, but balanced scorecards and KPIs, knowing where we started and where we're going um, and how we're tracking. Every time we take a risk reduction, we should get that reflected in a positive way. Anytime something new comes out like Blue Keep or Ripple, uh, we need to make sure we understand what the impact is to us uh, uh, within our facility. And finally, getting tactical, uh, detailed operational plans, rollouts, safety product, quality, et cetera. Um, so what does the team look like? Uh, you know, I've said before that management is a big deal and everybody thinks that, oh yeah, you've got an endpoint management perspective and a bias. That's why you think management is most important. Well, if you look at this, uh, I think it's a job seek uh, database, um, the cyber postings um, at the moment, if you see 29% are provisioning um, architecture, identity management, software engineering, 35% are operating and maintained. So patch management, configuration management, EV updates, 35% more than a third. And if you include actual newly provisions and management and lease privilege, as well as the actual day-to-day -day care and feeding, plus looking at vulnerabilities, AV whitelisting management, making sure they're up to date, et cetera, you quickly show the vast majority of jobs that are currently being sought or looked for or that are short for being posted. In, by contrast, if you look simply at the law enforcement, logging and data collection or SOC stuff, a very valuable component, but a very small percentage of the overall team. There's a lot of work to be done here. And so understanding um, that you need multiple disciplines and capabilities and heavy on the management endpoint uh, would be a very good starting point for you in taking these lessons learned and building um, uh, a manageable program. So what does Think Global Act Local mean? Well, when you take the platform, like we talked about agent and agentless data collection in automated uh, fashion, so you have real regular updates every 15 minutes or every hour, whatever your organization says, 
All this data helps you to grab information up into an analysis platform. Um, you take the data from the endpoints, but then you add the other context, right? So um, is the asset critical? What's the metadata on this asset? Where is it? How, where is it located? Who owns it? Is it critical to safe operations, et cetera? Let's take that inventory and let's layer the national vulnerability database over top of it so we can map vulnerabilities safely on all OT assets in near real time, as opposed to scaled back or targeted scans um, in, in periodic bursts. Um, you can continue to add other, other data with the backup status, the antivirus status, et cetera. So what you're effectively building by pulling all this data up into a single pane of glass is that you can then see your entire fleet of assets um, either by asset type, by asset location. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the client with six generation facilities are looking at all six sites uh, from a single uh, pane of glass, a single portal. Um, and we also have a client that's doing this globally. So they have uh, 6,000 assets in 57 countries. Um, they can actually pull up Windows 7 across their fleet to go and figure out what their uh, extended support contracts can look like with Microsoft. Um, and so this architecture allows you to scale a very small set of experts, both IT and OT, to look at your current status and whatever the current risk is and be able to build and understand not only the priority for your organization, but the actual uh, contextual risk, right? If I were to take raw risk from the National Vulnerability Database and sort it down to just critical risk on what is tribal knowledge for uh, high impact assets, but then bring in the third party marker of do I have a recent uh, good backup, I now have that subset is high impact assets with a critical risk and no recent backup. That's the holy grail of what OT security should be chasing. Um, and this sort of central visibility um, is a key component to that. Now, taking it the other way is my next case study. So uh, think global, act local in practice. Um, we had a client, large operating company with thousands of miles of assets to monitor. They did have a distributed team of SCADA security and compliance members throughout North America. Um, they had thousands of assets comprised of varying OS types. Uh, and all assets were spread out across hundreds of physical sites, many of which are unmanned. So, you know, long haul SCADA type of environment. Before they had this global, think global, act local, and this, and this enterprise wide view of their assets, um, the a security update had come out. It wasn't BlueKeep, but this is with BlueKeep over here. Um, and they were able to sort of measure anecdotally between the two scenarios. Um, when the first, without the, the, the visibility and the platform based approach, um, you know, again, mirroring the ITSM, IT systems management into OT. So you want a systems management means visibility and management capabilities and automation. They had to pull dozens of people in spreadsheets together into multiple meetings. Um, they didn't really have a concrete understanding of scope because they knew they had a risk. Um, they knew they had to deploy this patch significantly and everywhere, but they weren't sure how many of them they had, what the criticality of the assets were, who was in which location, et cetera. Many guesses and assumptions were made. Uh, in determining facts like where they should probably start. These are hunches. Well, we should maybe do the data center first. Well, let's do the big facilities where there's you know staff on site, et cetera. And then they started to manually patch the process. Um, the man, they also manually tracked it because they had started from spreadsheets. Uh, in total, it took six full-time staff diverted from their otherwise very busy operational and engineering schedules, uh, 10 weeks to complete. They spent roughly 2,500 hours uh, to reach about 90% coverage. And all they did was deploy the patch. Um, if, they, if they couldn't apply the patch uh, or they, they didn't do anything else. Now, when they had this agent-based ability to not only inventory the tool, the assets, but to manage the assets as well, and that's a key component to that different technology approach, agent-based technology allows you to inventory in detail in real time. It also allows you to manage. So they took the dashboard and the central team with their 360 degree view, they actually had an immediate list of exactly which assets needed this patch. Uh, they knew the scope of the asset, its location, its criticality, who the owner was, et cetera, because they had all this in their hands and their automated database. They then had a kickoff meeting with a small set of key personnel. So they didn't have dozens of people in the meeting, they didn't need it. And while they were doing this, they decided to kick off an email to all field staff. And this was remember for Bluekeep that they were going to disable remote access across the fleet, again, with this agent. So the Think Global, the ability corporately to grab one particular task and deploy it across all the facilities was instantly executed. Um, they then started to push the patch, at least the files, to all of those endpoints. Nobody actually touched the endpoints, nothing changed on the endpoint um, other than that service was turned off. 
Um, they then used uh, local techs to roll to higher risk assets and oversee patches. So OT can have that last mile oversight. The patch can be there, it can be ready to go. It can be even automated, except the flag can be set to say, okay, someone has to stand at this console. Um, so basically the central team built the plan, executed multiple phases, started with disabling remote desktop, automating the deployment of the files, and then systematically with staff support and in order of priority, actually deploying the patches. All progress was reported up into their dashboard that they started from to show exactly how many they had. As the systems got patched, they came out of the, uh, the red list and into the green list. And so the total effort was only three core staff. They only spent 600 hours and they reached 90%, but the remaining 10% through the agent were able to leave remote desktop disabled or to do other compensating controls like disabling the guest account uh, from enabling remote desktop sessions. So a completely different world. This looks much more like IT. Um, uh, obviously IT is uh, homogenous and they just you know, often automate the tasks. We have the ability if we are creative to have as much automation as OT can manage, but really, really save significant time and effort um, as well as increase our accuracy and our efficiency. So last couple of things here, I know I'm almost out of time. Uh, the benefit of this approach, cost is greatly reduced. Automation saves time and increases accuracy. Central view leverages scarce resources um, and a specialized team with global reach reduces duplication. You're not doing the same thing in multiple facilities. You're doing it once and sharing it everywhere. OT safety is ensured by having the central team start things and manage and automate as much as possible, but to give the keys to drive the last mile to the OT team. Uh, we're able to provide context, which is key to OT decision-making. I could turn on vulnerability mapping in your environment and probably find thousands of risks, but they're not all equal. Uh, and tracking, how are we doing? How are we justifying the team? Do we need more or less? Do we need to go faster or slower? This is a sample dashboard uh, of the CSC 20 controls and the ability to uh, see that sort of reporting. And we'll go too much into that. But what are your options, okay? Um, we can try to boil the ocean, do everything at once, rapid improvement, full team awareness and involvement. That's not a bad thing, but it's significant. Um, we could do a methodical rollout by business unit, by risk, by budget, et cetera. Uh, or we could do a staged approach, approach. Put your building blocks in place. You remember that pyramid, start with an inventory, get some automated visibility, and then use that to build your roadmap. We have a client that uses technology to build a roadmap uh, from a gap analysis. The gap analysis discovered, for example, over 300 devices not patched for WannaCry, WannaCry not Petcha, and 83 PLCs that had exploitable firmware, five dual home systems, four of which are running TeamViewer. Um, that same sort of investment up front can help you with the planning if you need it. Um, the benefits of a second generation approach, they come in two buckets. On the project level, when you roll this out and design it, you get multiple divisions, multiple departments involved in planning, uh, which helps not only in execution, but in maintenance. You get better support and upkeep um, of the program and your ability to anticipate and manage cost uh, is significant. On the maintenance side, you get a significant increase in accuracy, visibility, uh, and a decrease in effort, rework, or outstanding risk. So in summary, um, risk is on the rise. Uh, it's not going away. Increased technical debt and growth in tech and exploits. So we continue to go backwards. I think we're slowly sliding back in OT in terms of the risk is just coming faster than, than our remediation is able to keep up with. So therefore, a programmatic plan is required. You can't just give me risk and patch. You have to be able to have compensating controls. Um, and OT context solutions. All roads lead to a comprehensive real-time inventory and status. Um, individual, uh, non-connected, disparate tool sets uh, or that are manually updated or, or in many cases we have clients pulling data via homegrown scripts when they have a summer intern uh, to try and pull data and then when that intern's back at school and the script breaks, um, they've lost their visibility. Um, the mouse and cookie is how we got here. That plus a few legacy challenges like disparate tools, silos of responsibility, and not knowing what the end game is. Changing your approach to say, look, I need a program. Let's make program-based decisions. Let's build automation into this. Let's build management into this. And I mean management of the, of the endpoints, management actions, the ability to actually correct and reduce risk. Um, and the, real is, the realization though is that second generation of OT security is realistic and is significantly improved. Uh, that same client that used the gap analysis and found all the, all the horrible horror stories, um, they're significantly locking down that visibility and reducing the risk and are on pace to save uh, over $600,000 worth of manual effort this year.
uh, through their automation and their and their aggregation capabilities. So it really is a possibility, and I hope that this helped sort of push um, the thought process and and the and the and the listeners towards you know maybe changing the we can't do agents, we can't do automation, we should just sit in the periphery. No, we can do these things with OT. We can touch them. We can secure them. We can automate a lot of this. We can stretch our scarce resources. We just need to be creative. Uh, and that's it, James. Thanks for the, for okay. the platform. Thank you very much, Rick. Appreciate it. Uh, great presentation. I'm just uh, looking at any possible questions that have come through. Uh, the folks are a little bit shy, it would appear. That's okay. So am I. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know what? If any questions come up, folks, by all means, um, get in touch with Rick or Megan. They have a virtual stand as well and contact details there as well as downloads uh, so you can learn a little bit more about how they're helping clients uh, in the industrial space. Uh, once again, I want to thank you very much. Um, folks are saying great presentation. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, we will probably see uh, a lot more uh, activity on this. And I know I shared your presentation in the build up to this show on uh, social media channels. And a lot of folks in the industry, a lot of SMEs were saying that OT systems management was probably one of the most important areas right now that we're not addressing as aggressively as we probably should. Mm -hmm. And sorry, I don't have it up here, James, if I may. Uh, if you go to Verve Industrial and the events page, uh, my colleague, J James, you know, Ron Brash, very noted expert yep. in, in yep. security risk, especially in the embedded. He's actually doing a webinar on uh, found risk in embedded and OT stuff. So if you're interested in deep, digging deeper into the actual bits and bytes and the good guy, bad guy stuff, my colleague yep. Ron is doing a webinar about a week or so here. Cool. Yeah, Ron's great. Uh, very good at the technical stuff. And we had yeah. him on our aviation cybersecurity show. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, I would agree with Excellent. you. Thank you very much, Rick. No Thanks, for Thanks again for the platform. Appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.